So hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Charleston in between on publishing integrity. I'm going to give everyone a few minutes to get joined, get their audio set up, um, and then we'll start the show. Welcome and thank you for joining us. I'm Leah Hines. I'm the executive director of the Charleston Hub, and I am very pleased uh, to be saying a warm welcome and introduction on behalf of Charleston. The session is being recorded and videos will be sent out to all registered attendees within 48 hours. And then we'll also make them openly available on the Charleston Conference's YouTube channel after a month so that anyone can watch. Uh, we do ask that you would complete a very brief attendee evaluation after the end of the session. We'll do one after today's event and another one after tomorrow, day two. Uh, but you only really need to fill that out once. We just we put that at the end of both sessions in case you're only able to make it to one. But just uh, please feel uh, free to ignore the second reminder if you attend this one and tomorrow's session. Closed captioning is enabled. You can turn on captions or the transcript by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please feel free to use the attendee chat. We'd love to have you introduce yourself, um, but do use the Q&A button to ask questions for the panelists. We'll be asking those during the Q&A session after each presentation. Um, and speaking of the attendee chat, uh, please use, use that now to tell us where you're joining from, say hello. And we have many people who are joining from uh, group, group watches, uh, group settings. So if you're watching in that classroom or meeting room setup, let us know how many people are there and just uh, say hello to everyone. Um, we have around 22% international attendees from 12 different countries. So I'd like to say a special uh, warm welcome to our international uh, registrants who are joining us. Thank you for being here. Um, our agenda today, we're gonna start with a presentation on why integrity in research and publishing matters, followed by a short break then institutions, libraries, and their role in research integrity, and how to define integrity standards and in publishing with integrity, followed by a close up and wrap, uh, closing wrap up. Um, and at this point, I would really like to say a special thank you to Sven Fund, who is managing director at Reviewer Credits. Sven put in countless hours behind the scenes, put this together, recruited speakers, helped with topics. I mean, he he really did put the whole show together. So Sven, thank you. And I'm gonna turn it over to you at this point. Thank you so much, Leah. And uh, good afternoon from Berlin, everybody. Um, I'm really happy to be your host together with uh, Leah today and tomorrow afternoon from my perspective and mornings from many of your perspectives. Um, you know that a conference is just as good as the audience and its willingness to interact. So please be active, share your thoughts, um, and most importantly, your questions with the presenters. Otherwise, it could be uh, a little bit boring um, at the end of the presentations. I'm sure not in the presentations. Um, there's one little uh, change to our agenda. Unfortunately, our anonymous researcher dropped out last minute. I find this really sad, um, and uh, I think the input would have given us an important um, point, basically important points to discuss and consider. Thanks to Curtis Brandy, who was kind enough to move uh, his slot to a little bit of an earlier time today. Why publishing integrity and not research integrity? A lot of people asked me in preparation of um, this Charles in between. Well, I think it's good for us as um, publishers, vendors, librarians to focus what we are really responsible for and um, to get our shop in order wherever we can. At London Book Fair last week, I was flabbergasted that there were more activities around topics like uh, publishing integrity, um, um, research integrity, than there were around uh, books themselves. So while we want to focus, as I said, um, as much as we can uh, on publishing integrity, we don't want to miss the essence. And that's why our first presenter, Mohamed Hosseini, uh, will tell us more from a researcher's perspective why integrity and um, in research and in publishing kind of matters. And you will see how he has put it up. This will be followed by a short um, interview that the two of us want to do, and then obviously opening it as soon as we can up to a conversation with all of you. 
Let me introduce Mohammed. He is assistant professor at North, uh, Northwestern University in the Department of Preventive Medicine. All Americans know that's in Chicago. Now everybody else knows. Uh, Mohammed holds a BA in uh, business management from Eindhoven in the Netherlands, an MA in applied ethics from Utrecht University, and a PhD in research ethics and integrity from Dublin in Ireland. Mohammed collaborates with the Northwestern University Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute and the Institute for Artificial Intelligence in Medicine. He is a guest lecturer and res of research ethics and integrity, uh, an associate editor of the journal Accountability in Research, and he is a member of the Global Young Academy. With that, Mohammed, over to you. Thank you very much. It's great to be here, and thanks for this introduction. Um, so, as was mentioned, my name is Mohammed. Um, uh, I'm based here in Chicago. It's actually 8 a.m. here. Um, I'm trained in applied ethics, which basically means that I apply ethical principles, values, and virtues in real life situations. Um, I specialize in the ethics of research and research integrity. And within this small field, I'm primarily focused on the ethics of scientific collaborations and publications attributions of credit and responsibilities, citation ethics, open science, and my most recent work um, primarily focuses on the ethics of using AI in research and education. Um, when Sven invited me to this um, talk, I told him that our publishers really interested in integrity. And he said, well, yeah, you know, more recently they are. I said, you know, the most recent publishing um, event I attended was the SSP conference in Chicago in 2022. I was presenting two posters back then. And, um, you know, when I was talking with people about research integrity, they were like, ah, cute, <laughs> integrity, nice, good words, you know. Uh, but Sven told me that uh, more recently, there's been um, a lot of more attention being paid to the topic. And that made me very enthusiastic and interested about this. So with that, I hope that uh, you will, um, we will all have a nice conversation. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, okay. My research is funded and I'm um, um, really grateful for my funders. Uh, I have to acknowledge that. Thanks my, to my funders. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, uh, I will start with a brief introduction of what is actually integrity and what are some of the challenges of talking about integrity and defining it. Um, and then I will talk about the integrity in research and integrity in publications. And then um, hopefully we'll have a nice chat with Sven and any other one who might be interested in this. Um, next, please. Also next. Great. So um, integrity is, is a popular term, but it's also a kind of puzzling term in the sense that it is value laden and um, covers a variety of meanings. But for the most part, it is difficult to define. Um, like if you look at a dictionary, um, this is one of the definitions you see, you know, like the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles, moral uprightness. Um, and also as a state of being hold, whole and undivided. Um, can you please press next? Yes, exactly. Um, when we look at the thesaurus, we see a range of synonyms like honesty, probity, rectitude, honor, good character, ethics, morals, virtue, righteousness, morality, decency, fairness, scrupulousness, sincerity, truthfulness, trustworthiness. Like these are all very, very different things. Um, we probably don't use probity instead of honesty when we want to use honesty. Like we don't use honor instead of rectitude. They are all very, very different from each other. Now, when media uses integrity, the term is often put in contrast with um, concepts like fraud, corruption, conflict of interests, abuse of power, self-enrichment, shady declarations, and, well, more recently, even plagiarism. Um, when companies use it, um, it is sometimes used along the lines of environmental friendliness or corporate social responsibility. Now, it seems integrity is more like a container concept 
and a label for too many different things. Um, there is this philosopher called um, Greg, sorry, Greg Shkerkoske, and he has a book called Integrity and the Virtues of Reason. He characterizes integrity as the Swiss army knife of virtues, which I think is quite apt because of what I just explained, that it's very difficult to define and it is a container concept for many things. So let's keep this in mind that integrity has this feature. Integrity is like a Swiss army knife. And however tempting it is to pull all the things we admire in people in integrity, um, using a term ambiguously like this increases the chances of confused conversations. So it's important to, to understand the core of this concept and clarify what are we actually talking about when we talk about integrity. And I'm hoping that in the next slide, I will be able to, um, to um, infer and use some of the philosoph philosophical views to highlight some of the quintessential components of integrity um, and then hopefully we can extrapolate that to integrity in research and integrity in publications. Normally, when we have a problem defining something, like when defining something is very complicated, we uh, reach out to philosophers. But even when we do that in, uh, in terms of uh, trying to figure out what integrity means, it's not that we get the same response from um, philosophers as well. I'll mention three philosophers and how they have defined um integrity um and hopefully that will be um the sort of takeaway message we can take from this bit of the conversation and um you know um talk about it later um according to harry frankfurt the the, the man on top um integrity can be equated with wholeheartedness and it has a direct relationship to autonomy so for him um, a person's desires and volitions should be in harmony. The second person, Christine Korsgaard, she describes integrity in terms of your entire nature working as an integrated whole and then links it with autonomy and identity. So that is to say your actions and choices constitute your identity. So every move you make, you decide who you are. So she comes up with this more complicated web of concepts to describe integrity. Um, the third person, uh, Cheshire Calhoun, she argues that um, the notion of standing for something is at the core of integrity. And then she nicely and tightly connected that to uh, viewing yourself as a member of the community, which I think is quintessential for discussing integrity in contexts like publication and research because it is not only about what I do, it is about what culture and what environment I'm in and what attitudes and what um, behaviors are endorsed within that environment. And after a while, people might um, change themselves for the good or for the bad, unfortunately. So um, a hasty conclusion um, may be that um, given what philosophers say, we seem to have three threats here. One is autonomy, one is identity, and one is community. Meaning that integrity has to do with actions that are done you know, autonomously and actions that say something about an individual's identity, but cannot be seen in a vacuum and are really tightly related to community norms. So far, so good. Now let's look at integrity in, 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 in uh, research. Um, according to European Network for Research Ethics and Integrity, research integrity is recognized that the attitude and habit of researchers to conduct research according to appropriate ethical, legal, and professional frameworks, obligations, and standards. Great. So here too, we see the same Swiss army knife attitude, except in my perspective, there is a width of an invitation to be obedient, as in do your science, but follow ethical, legal, and professional frameworks. Um, and this last bit is quite interesting, uh, something I'll get, get, get back to shortly. When talking about research integrity in, in trainings with researchers, we always discuss the importance of research integrity and why it is needed. 
Um, and when we start that, I guess for researchers as a as a community of professionals, at the start it sounds a bit weird um, because you know if if you are in a different vocation, if you're in a different um, job, people don't really discuss with you. For instance, if you're a bus driver, if you're a barber, people don't really discuss with you why you should not cut corners. They don't lecture you on why you should not cut corners. They don't give you credit for not cutting corners. But we do this with researchers and we do that for good reasons. Um, in any case, we need research integrity, you know, to preserve society's trust in science. Um, research integrity norms promote values that are essential to collaborative to collaborative work and help us ensure that researchers can be held accountable to the public and um, it helps us build public support for research. So in this sense, we see researchers as professionals whose work has serious consequences for the society. Um, and since most of them are also funded by taxpayers' money, um, we expect them to be responsible and accountable to the taxpayers. But because we also want to encourage freedom of thought and freedom of expression and autonomy of ideas and so on and so on, it's kind of difficult to create a balance between, oh yeah, be free and do whatever you want, but adhere to this norm and that framework and this legal um, and ethical um, component of what it is to do research. So in that sense, um, we need a sort of tight grip on researchers. And this is where that mandatory aspect comes in, um, uh, which is also something that is discussed by many sociologists of science, like um, Robert Merton, who says, you know, whatever method you choose in your research is um, is up to you, but um, the norms of research are mandatory and they are um, not negotiable. Um, uh, when thinking about guidelines, in my point of view, over the past few years, there's been a sort of noticeable trend towards stricter oversight of research activities. And this is partly facilitated through the implementation of open science practices. Um, like um, when we as in research integrity experts talk about it, we rightly say that open science aims to make research more transparent and so on. That is 100% true. But one can also say that in a in a, in a way, we are also creating this panopticon that makes researchers feel like they're being constantly watched. Like open science, yes, makes things transparent, but the onus is on, for the most part, on researchers to make themselves transparent. Um, and in so doing, they are constantly feeling like they're being watched, you know? Um, and there's a part of me that thinks, you know, maybe we expect what we ex maybe what we expect from researchers, like in terms of being open and record everything and report every step is too demanding. We don't expect this level of transparency from most other professionals. But then there's another part of me that thinks, well, maybe this is needed. Like if we don't do this, we may lose public support and trust in science because otherwise the society might um, be more prone to like pseudoscience and misinformation, which are like really hot topics right now. Um, and this is again, touches on the responsibility of researchers. You know, um, when discussing these with researchers, we, we describe why public support matters. And sometimes researchers tell us that this is the first time they thought about it this way. Like they say that, yeah, um, I never thought that my research results play an important role in social conflict, um, but they do. Like, let's think about, for instance, um, 20 years ago when um, different communities and different societies were thinking about um, banning to smoke in public spaces, right? Um, for a long time, this was a highly contentious and maybe even politicized debate. Um, and you know there were certain values that were at stake, like personal freedom, public health, and then the debate could have gone forever and ever and ever. But then researchers came up with evidence about the effects of secondhand smoke or the relationship between lung cancer and smoking tobacco. And at that point, a certain point of view in relation to smoking in public was justified, and then was later enforced. 
So this is one of those areas that shows us, you know, how impactful research can be and how researchers can have an influence on day-to-day -day life of millions of people. Um, so for research to keep this status, to remain as the sort of trusted arbitrator of social conflicts, we want it to be trusted. And for it to be trusted, we want researchers to be trusted. For researchers to be trusted, we want them to do research with integrity. Um, another important aspect of research integrity is that, um, and this is the, the bit that goes back to what Colquhoun was talking about, about the community. Um, uh, research integrity also applies um, to institutions. So it's not just about a person, it's also about institutions. And institutions are working hard to maintain research integrity and promote it. Um, there is six aspects that um, are discussed um, in relation to the responsibilities of institutions in terms of promoting and upholding research integrity norms. The first one is uh, that they should provide leadership and stewardship to support responsible conduct of research. Um, like they can do this with, um, you know, their workflows, make sure that uh, their in, uh, internal procedures are synchronized with up-to-date guidelines, you know, like you have COPE, there's institutions, there's um, um, universities that might endorse or might not, uh, but those are seen as a sort of progressive and up-to-date guidelines. Um, they should, the second one is that they should encourage respect for everyone involved in research. Um, we can see this um, with universities that promote LGBTQI+. Plus. Um, um, no, this slide should not be advancing, by the way. Thank you for, for, for reminding me of that. Um, or women's rights, religious minorities. Um, the third one is about enabling support systems. Um, you know, universities have integrity offices, ombuds offices, DEI initiatives, and so on. Um, the fourth one is about producting interaction between trainees and mentors. You know, they should um, afford time for supervising and mentoring and so on to make sure that uh, the more experienced and the less experienced um, um, members of the research community can um, gain from each other and can learn from each other. Um, the fifth one is um, advocating for adherence to rules regarding um, all aspects of uh, research. Um, and the sixth one is to anticipate, reveal, and manage individual and institutional conflicts. So a long list um, with a range of responsibilities that are put also on institutions. And it is on us, people like me and you, members of the community, to hold our institutions to account and say, um, hey, this is the best practice. Why, why are we lagging behind? Why are we not doing what we're supposed to do? Um, publications. Um, so now that we have a sense of research integrity and why it is needed, let's think about publications in publication integrity. Um, can you please proceed and go to the next slide? Perfect, thank you. Um, when I was when I was uh, preparing for this presentation, um, I searched the PubMed and Google Scholar to find the earliest mentions of the term publication integrity. Um, and to my surprise, this was as recent as 2001 in the third edition of an edited book entitled Fraud and Misconduct in Biomedical Research, written by Michael Farthing, um, who uh, in the 18th chapter of the book, uh, he's actually an emeritus professor at the University of Sussex. Um, and he describes integrity in publications as... Um, you know, um, integrity throughout the process of publication, starting from writing the paper until the work is published. And then he mentions issues like, um, um, you know, um, traditional authorship issues and irregularities like gift authorship, duplicate authorship, salami slicing, and uh, more serious issues like conflict of interest and, and, and plagiarism. Um, he also discusses the role played by editors and peer reviewers and um, talks about issues like confidentiality. And when he talks about confidentiality, he uses a very interesting analogy that I think um, is worth sharing here. He, he writes, and I'm quoting, it is essential that editors reinforce to peer reviewers the need to observe the rules of confidentiality. 
In many respects, the relationship between an editor and the reviewer and an author is similar to the doctor-patient relationship. I think this is an interesting analogy in terms of highlighting why confidentiality matters. Um, there's also other things discussed in publication ethics, um, and you know, to my understanding, they include authorship standards and maybe use definitions of author, uh, which basically determine who should be an author and how credit and responsibilities should be attributed. Authorship order descriptions of contributions through taxonomies like credit, um, publication strategy, which again, to my understanding, is like decisions we make about where and when to publish. Citations and referencing, huge issue, wasn't really discussed um, a lot until very recently. Um, I remember in 2019, I was working on um, a, a citation ethics project and people were like, well, but this is a low level issue. Like we have bigger fish to fry. We are thinking about fabrication and falsification. Who cares about an inaccurate citation? But now we're seeing that um, citation ethics is so important. It can even uh, bring down um, top leaders in um, high-ranked universities. Um, there's also issues related to um, questionable and fraudulent practices in publications. And I think the reasons why publication integrity matter is mostly similar to why research integrity matters. You know, we want um, research and publications to be trusted. We need that trusted sources of science um, and research. And to the extent that research and publications involve different partners who are you know, among core members of the research group or not, they also involve different norms, values, and virtues um, that may be equally endorsed by everyone or not. Um, in terms of differences, I think there is difference between the process and oversight structures when it comes to discussing research integrity and publication integrity. Um, in my opinion, communication and relationships are quite different in both concepts. Um, like uh, in publication integrity, there is a lot of communication between maybe authors and um, peer reviewers and editors and so on, and maybe later on with the readership um, and the journal readership and uh, the publishers, the owners of the publishing house, the journal editors. But in the research um, context, it's probably these relationships are more um, um, limited to like the core research group or their relationship with their institutions, their relationship with their funders. So relationships are, are different when we think about research integrity versus uh, publication integrity. Um, and again, you know, sometimes these different stakeholders might have different norms. Journals might be owned by different publishers who might have different business structures or business models. Um, and depending on what model or structure is endorsed, they, they might behave differently. I think within the editorial process, the fact that we have voluntary actors like um, some editors and, and reviewers means that they bring with them certain expectations and perspectives that may be different from those who actually conducted the research. Um, they also bring their own biases and mistakes, of course. Um, uh, and researchers, you know, um, deal with funders and universities that may care or not about, about publishers, you know. Um, so one way of putting the differences between research integrity and publication integrity, I think, is to say that they are concerned with different parties, workflows, and structures. To sum up, I think Thinking about integrity as a Swiss army knife is helpful in that it clarifies the complexities of describing exactly what integrity is. Research integrity and publication integrity are both necessary for maintaining um, a healthy research environment and preserving society's trust in science, which, as I said, is very important because we want the society to hold science to account and trust in science as a social arbiter. Um, to have they, they both have major overlaps, publication integrity and uh, research integrity, um, but they involve different actors who are concerned with different relationships. Um, with that, I I really like to thank you both, um, Leah and Sven, for organizing this, and uh, for um, all of you who have been here. It's been a pleasure, and I look forward to uh, having a conversation with Sven and also answering any questions that there may be. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Mohamed. That was a wealth of information and wealth of perspectives. Um, and I really like uh, the idea, the, the image of the Swiss army knife. Um, let me add one element, if I may. As you know, there are different sizes of Swiss army knives, uh, as I found out when I lived in uh, Switzerland. Um, you have uh, spoken a lot on the publication process, the research process, the players involved. Um, maybe make it to make it explicit, there's obviously also an economic interest um, in all of this uh, by funders, by publishers who are also commercial entities, by libraries who are spending um, money or institutions that are spending money on it. How do you think this impacts the integrity or the conditions under which integrity has to be upheld? I think a lot. Um... There is, so from researchers perspective, um, there is critical views, um, like people like Pierre Bordeaux, um, who say, actually, what is considered as a worthwhile topic in research has to do more with what topic is considered as hot. And that more often than not has to do with what topics are attracting more money. Now, when you look at it, for instance, from um, the perspective of what researchers are doing now, like many researchers, myself included, are working on AI. Why do you think we're working on AI? Because it is a hot topic. And believe it or not, there's a lot of investment in it. I think among all the sectors, um, AI is considered as one of those that has attracted the most investment in, in the last 12 months. So there's a lot of money in it. And there's a lot of attention being paid to it. Many people are trying to frame their work as um, part of the artificial intelligence debate um, and try to connect themselves, no matter how, with that bandwagon. And to the extent that money plays a role in it, those interests are also involved. Um, I think from publishers' perspective, they've been traditionally... Um, what you know they've been a business for for centuries now and um that makes those sectors i think slightly more conservative like you see them move a little bit slower you see them um sometimes be a little bit more aggressive sometimes less so um, and they are th these attitudes are all uh, formed and informed by financial interests um so i think <laughs> they play an important role definitely yeah, I can absolutely testify to that. So every conference I've been uh, to over the last year or so has AI clearly as high on the agenda. Um, so AI seems to be the new OA, basically, after the last 15 years that we have speaking have been speaking a lot about open access. It seems that um, AI is one of the new hot topics. And I think that's a perfect bridge into my, my second thought. And please, everybody, um, put your questions into the Q&A so we can answer them in a minute. But it seems that research integrity and publishing integrity issues are not new. Also, challenges in those fields are not new. Um, and uh, we see over the last uh, 20 years at least two major trends, 20, 30 years. One is a globalization of science and research, I would say, right? So it's much more difficult to control that community that you spoke of um, because it is by now distributed around the globe. And secondly, there is a lot of inflow of digital, of technology. So if you would have been with me at uh, London Book Fair, I'm sure you would agree that everybody is speaking about investments in this feature and that piece and that product. And, and it is rarely a holistic view on research integrity, but it's trying to fix certain issues, um, whatever, fraud on images, uh, with specific software solutions, uh, trying to address exactly that one in contrast to those that claim there is um, workflow solutions that make the whole workflow um, in publishing integrity, if regarding publishing integrity, at least uh, safer. So what would you say is the, mo is the, the more um, systematic change? Is it globalization? Is it technology coming into the fray? Or what's, what's more significant in your view when we look back in 20 years to today, what do you think is the inflection point if there is any of the two of them? I think the more important trend is the digitization. Um, because, yeah, 
globalization, true, I fully get it. But in a place like, say, the United States or like in most European countries, you have people from all around the world. So people from different parts of the world bring their way of work and thinking with them, again, myself included, um, to the floor. So you don't really have to be working with um, a country in um, Asia or Africa in order to be labeled as someone who's doing international work. You can be working with an expat, and that is also international work. You know, it happens in your in the soil of one country, but in principle, you are doing international work. So for me, the bigger trend is digitization um, and the fact that um, different people have different access to different digital platforms. Um, and there is also a difference in terms of digital literacy, information literacy. Um, and to the extent that these differences play a role in how people understand their own environment, they also behave differently. And those behaviors result in, you know, all kinds of uh, mismatches between um, people who may, for instance, um, have this bit of the infrastructure, but not that bit. What do, what do I do in order to negotiate better, to get a better deal? What do I do in order to um, stand out? What do I do in order to um, offer a feature, like you said, you know? So for me, the digitization is the, is the bigger frame, is the bigger trend. So, so that's super interesting. And you said earlier that, um, or we agreed earlier that um, integrity issues in research and in other fields, and I really loved your phrase that um, uh, more or less words have consequences, seems to be a little bit like in research and politics at least, right? So uh, we see a, a lot of changes there in a relatively short period of time. So in less than a generation for researchers, there's a lot of new issues coming up, which are supported, triggered, whatever, um, by technology, by digitization. Um, how do you think um, publishers and, and also institutions, university and, universities and so on, should respond to this new push, basically, on, on their system, more or less, like these new challenges that are out there, whether they are positive or negative? I think that's spot on, and that's a very difficult question um, that has like many facets to it. Um, as far as I understand, um, investment is one way of dealing with it. Like I think um, one thing that digitization affords us is that it makes almost it almost makes dissemination free. You know, like. Um, um, you, you're not really concerned about the number of pages or I don't know, the ink charges or things like that. Um, putting things out there is free, but making sense of things has become a lot more complicated. Uh, finding the right thing has become a lot more complicated. Now we have so much content that myself as a researcher who is in an affluent institution that has access to almost any reputable source you can think of, I find it extremely difficult to find the sources I need because there's just so much and there's a plurality of formats and plurality of places where information is now stored. Um, so investing on technology and investing on systems that can sift through the internet, sift through the sources and find the relevant ones is absolutely crucial. I think, um, to your point about um, the fact that, yeah, like there's been um, this um, uh, new trend of uh, trying to um, regulate things and trying to make sure that um, things are done in a certain way. I think for researchers who are now entering the workforce, it is overwhelming to have to catch up with how much regulations there are. Like for people of maybe your generation and those before you, like maybe people who are now 60 years or old or something like that. For, for them, they have lived through the past 30 years or so, and they have been in the workforce as new rules and regulations and frameworks have been introduced. Yeah. Imagine if you're starting now, you have to catch up and 
to fully understand why something matters or to fully understand the evolution of um, this regulation of the technology and regulation of the digital world, you really have to spend a lot of time just catching up. And that is not easy. So investing, investing, investing in that is also helpful. And I think that's one of those things that um, needs one-on-one -on -one mentorship. Like I keep repeating this also in my own university that you really need to invest in one on one mentorship um, if you really want to have good researchers, if you want to have a nice culture in, 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 in a university or in a community. Yeah, super. There was another um, element that you highlighted, which was um, openness, open science, basically. And um, Anne Stone is asking a question here, which uh, she has actually asked two questions. Uh, I'll pick the second one, which uh, con uh, ne connects to that point. Regarding Dr. Fatherling's book and Leichnam confidentiality in peer review to doctor-patient relationship, what do you think is the open... What do you think of the open peer review movement to change uh, that norm a quarter century later? Does open create more trust or require more trust? I think open, so I am one of those people who writes my name under anything I review. So I, I, either as an editor or as a reviewer, I edit a lot, I review a lot, and I always write my name at the bottom. And I do that for a reason. Um, one is that I think the relationship between a peer reviewer and an author should not be hierarchical. Even in double-blind peer review systems, a reviewer will ultimately see the name of the authors if the paper is accepted, correct? But an author will never know who the reviewer was. And I think that this that imbalance is unnecessary. Um, that being said, I've also had instances where um, disclosing the name of an author, sorry, disclosing the name of a peer reviewer um, has made the author react in a certain way. Um, as an editor, for instance, I once saw that a PhD student um, wrote their name at the bottom of the peer review report. And then the author's response to that PhD student was slightly worse than the response to the person who had not disclosed their name. And that was partly, to my understanding, because they considered the PhD student as a, as a junior person, as someone who doesn't know what they're talking about. And I think this is, uh, this is a problem. But, you know, it, it still doesn't um, dissuade me from disclosing my name. Um, I'm an early career researcher. I still am happy to disclose my name because I want to cr to prevent that the imbalance. I want to, to stop that imbalance. Uh, and I want the, the reviewers to know, sorry, I want the authors to know exactly who they are dealing with. And that's fine. Um, in terms of the analogy that was used by uh, Michael Farthing, um, I think, um, honestly, that was, it is an interesting analogy, but I think it is an analogy that maybe belongs to the past. Um, I think the patient-physician relationship and the confidentiality um, is, was a thing when we had no preprints. Now, most of the stuff um, that people submit to journals is already published as a preprint. Um, if it is not, well, you know, is it, I don't know. Uh, let me think about this. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that are published as preprints, so they are already out there. And that confidentiality, I think, is that has kind of made confidentiality less important. At the time when Michael Farthing was writing, there was no preprint. And um, confidentiality was a lot more important. Sometimes researchers had to wait for months for their paper to be peer reviewed and, and, and accepted for publications, sometimes even years. Um, that We are past that stage now with uh, the number of, um, in most disciplines, I would say, with the number of journals that we have, with the number of outlets that we have, and the, with the forms of publications that are now available. Um, but I think at the time, uh, the, the confidentiality was much more important in peer review. 
Super. Here's the last question for you, Mohammed. We are almost, no, we are already up on time. Uh, and I know this is a difficult one for you because it's a question to your philosophic philosopher's mind. Um, let's try whether you can answer this in one sentence. Um, your philosophical introduction makes me think of Helen Longino's work on social epistemology. epistemology. She has had it that scientists are not born, but are made by their social conditioning. Ideally, this should also instill a strong sense of integrity. So I am wondering whose responsibility do you think it is to instill still that sense of integrity? Well, the village. It, if it takes a village to raise a child, then it is the village's responsibility to instill that sense of integrity. Um, and I think it is also partly on, the, on researchers to be interested in it. Um, I think we as researchers have a responsibility to educate ourselves about certain important topics, diversity, equity, inclusion. Everybody has to know why these topics matter in their own context and um, how to uphold them. Everybody has to know why integrity matters in their own context and how to uphold integrity and how to promote it. Uh, because otherwise, you may as well do something else. This is, this is I think this is one of those so I'd like to refer to um, something that Jacques Lacan said. He um, made an addition to what um, I think Freud had said about um, impossible, impossible vocations, impossible jobs. The original list was governance, pedagogy, and therapy, like, uh, you know, being in a governance uh, position, um, being in a teaching position, or being in a doctor-patient physician relationship. Jacques Lacan added a fourth one. He said, being a researcher is also an impossible um, job because of how many conflicts there are, because of how many competing interests there are, because of how many dilemmas you have to deal with. So in that sense, I think, one, it is the village's responsibility, and two, it is also the researcher's responsibility to be interested in it, uh, because otherwise, you may as well do something else. Well, I'm at super. That was a long sentence, even for a philosopher. Thank you so Thank much you. Uh, for kicking us off today. That was a perfect presentation to get started with. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, thanks for the questions from the audience. We will be back in 12 minutes. 10 a.m. Eastern um, with the next presentation and discussion with Curtis Brandy. Thank you so much and enjoy your break.